All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our UC Ag Expert Talk today. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the state, UC Statewide IPM program, and Cheryl Reynolds is also here with us and will help troubleshoot any technical problems. Um, please also note that this webinar is designed for growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environments. Okay, um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. David Haviland is an entomology and pest management ad farm advisor for the University of California Cooperative Extension at Kern County. And today he will be talking about managing navel orange worm in nut crops. And now I'd like to pass this over to David. David, you can go ahead and share your slides. All right, well, there we go. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, glad you all were able to, to join on. Looks like we've got a good crowd today. And, and I, I do like the, the makeup there. I was looking through the looking through the names of participants real quickly. and. Um, Lots of friends among the group, uh, you know, lots of lots of growers, lots of PCAs, lots of uh, chemical company representatives out there, but also just some some good old friends from other crops, even uh, even some graduate student friends. So, uh, and for those of you that are here, just um, maybe just for the credits at the end of the year, welcome. Also, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this hour and, and learn a little bit about navel orange worm. Um, you know, navel orange worm in California. It's a big deal. Uh, it's it's a really big deal, and so you know it justifies talking about it and and what can be done about it uh, as far as pests go. So let let's see here. There we go. So so just to start off a little about navel orange worm, and particularly for those of you that aren't as familiar with with almonds or, or don't grow them, um, it is pretty much the arch nemesis of almond and pistachio growers. Um, it does also affect walnuts, but the main concern is that it it feeds directly on the kernel. And obviously, if you sell nuts, um, you, don't, you don't sell leaves, you don't sell twigs or hulls or shells, you sell kernels. So a pest that specifically eats that kernel is very problematic. Uh, the other issue is that navel orange worm damage is associated with aflatoxins. So navel orange worm, when they get in and feed on the kernel, they can introduce fungi that can produce aflatoxins. Um, it's not common. Um, it, it's actually quite rare. Uh, but there's some very strict guidelines on the amount of aflatoxins that can be in the load. Um, and every year there's a few uh, few loads that are rejected. I've actually heard of a couple this year already. Um, so we've got to be careful with that. Another thing about navel orange worm is, you know, a lot of crops, let's just say if, uh, you know, if 1% of the crop gets eaten, you lose 1%. But that's not the case with navel orange worm because the amount of navel orange worm damage you have in the load affects the premiums. Um, so, you know, how many extra cents per pound you get on every single pound of the entire crop based on the percentage of damage. So, you know, even one, two, three percent of the nuts with navel orange worm damage, uh, when you multiply, you know, four, five, six, seven cents difference per pound across 3,000 pounds, uh, money adds up really fast. So, you know, management, um, you know, requires a uh, you know, a lot of effort uh, requires an integrated approach. There's no doubt about that. Okay, so um, so yeah, new new version of the slide. It's got a new picture. But the, the last point I wanted to make here. So you know, if you do the math, if you figure how many pounds of almonds there are every year, how many um, you know how many kernels are in each one of those pounds, if you just do the simple math and figure on every year about one percent of those nuts are damaged by navel orange worm. That's about 18 billion kernels every year. I mean, think about that. 18 billion kernels eaten by worms instead of by people. So, and that's just on the almond front. Um, you know, of course, the walnuts and pistachios are going to have of their own damage. So, again, big deal. So, to start off, you know, in this talk, I don't, you know, there's different approaches to different talks. The talk today, I want it to be more, a little more philosophical. Like, I don't want to tell you what to do. I want to tell you more why we do what we do. Um, just because we have people from such diverse areas. You know, if, if, if every one of you were an almond grower just from Kern County, that'd be different. But, you know, obviously, if we've got people from, you know, Yuba City doing walnuts on the same call, that's not as, uh, of much value. So, so I'm going to speak a little bit in generalities with principles and let you adapt those principles to your individual situation. Uh, this, just generally speaking, is the flights of navel orange worm. So navel orange worm 
typically has four flights per year. You can see those here, you know, April, May or so is the first flight. Second flights typically in the South Valley starts at the end of June and is through most of July. Third flight is typically in the month of August, spills over a little into September. And then the fourth flights typically in September. Now, if you're in the northern half of, the, of California, you may or may not have that fourth flight depending on the year. But why do I wanna show this? We got four flights, okay? This is how we manage naval orange room. So we'll call this my introductory, uh, introduction screen. So the first thing we'll talk about is sanitation. And what's the goal of sanitation? It's to prevent this first flight every year by pulling all the nuts out of the orchard in the winter so that none of those overwintering worms can become the first flight in April and May. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Uh, second thing we'll talk about is mating disruption. And in the case of mating disruption, uh, the goal is to put pheromone out there that prevents the males and females from finding each other. If they don't find each other and they don't mate, they don't make babies. Okay, so we're not trying to kill anything. We're just trying to prevent them from being born in the first place. Um, pretty, pretty good, pretty, pretty good concept. And main disruption is typically a season long program. So you can see the three purple arrow, arrows there um, where you know, when you put out a traditional main disruption product, you're gonna inhibit or, or slow down the ability of, of these moths to mate during the first flight and the second flight and the third flight. Um, also the fourth flight, but you know, that kind of gets you know, after, uh, after harvest for the most part for some people. But um, so that's main disruption. Uh, third thing we'll talk about is timely harvest. So the earlier you can get the nuts off the trees, the less damage they have. And there's some solid principles behind why that's the case. So you know, here I just put an arrow. Now, this is an almond chart, obviously. You know, the goal with nonpareils would be to get them off the tree before the third flight. Okay? Goal for Monterey's would be to get them off the tree for the fourth flight. And then on the bottom, um, you can see there's insecticides. So that's sort of the fourth leg of this you know, IPM chair or table. And in the case of insecticides, we target typically the second generation of worms which is the eggs and the young larvae laid by moths on the second flight. And this is, this is what you would call a hull split or a post hull split spray that are going on typically in the month of July. Okay, for those of you that are um, pistachio or walnut growers, let's see, why is my slide not advancing? There we go. Just took a minute to think. So uh, pistachios, if you're a pistachio grower, this is basically the same exact slide. Uh, the difference is your insecticides are targeting the third flight instead of the second flight. And you're trying to do your first shake before the fourth flight instead of the almonds where you're trying to do a first shake for the third flight. So um, just want to say generally the same thing. It's just some of the, the programs get shifted by one generation. So what I want to do is go, go through these four different sections a little bit and talk about their value. So sanitation. So this is going in the winter, knocking all the nuts off the tree, getting them on the ground, wind rowing them, you know, blowing them off the berms, wind row them, either disking them in as deep as you can or typically flail mowing them to just shred them up. Uh, it's nice to get the nuts out of the crotch of the trees. Uh, but you know, anything you do to destroy these nuts is going to help. Um, you know, if crows come and eat them, that's great. If there's lots of rain that rots them, that's great. You know, lots of factors that go into sanitation. But the goal here, based on research, is to get the tree down to two nuts per tree in the winter. And the research has shown that that makes a big difference at harvest. And let me show you why that's the case. So this is a, this is a slide from back in 1983, so decades old. On the x-axis is the number of mummies per tree. And on the y-axis is the percent damaged navel orange worm. And you can see there's this curve shape to it. And so what that means, uh, let's imagine, you know, the, the, you know, 20 is the highest end you can see on the x-axis here. Let's imagine you're at 100, okay? You can see that line kind of flat lines, right? So, you know, if you go from 100 mummies down to 50, eh, it helps, but doesn't make that big a deal. Down to 20, yeah, same thing. It helps, but not great. From 20 mummies down to 10, 
oops, you know, 20 mummies down to 10. Okay, starting to come down. But to see what happens to the shape of this curve when you start getting from six mummies per tree to four to two to one to a half, you can see how this curve just starts dropping off where the amount of damage at harvest is a big difference. Okay. Well, why is this? So the reason is, I'm gonna to, to explain that, I'm gonna use a case study here. So imagine you've got, you start with 200 mummies per tree and 10% of those have worms in it. Okay, very realistic, uh, very common to have that. Well, if you shake, if you shake and do all the sanitation and get down to two mummies per tree, you're going from 200 down to two. Okay, so right off the bat, what percent control of navel orangeum are you getting? Okay, if you go from 200 to two, that's a 99% reduction in navel orangeum. Uh, that's awesome. Okay, insecticides, you're lucky, you know, 50% is kind of the standard number for an insecticide spray. A couple of insecticide sprays, you maybe get a 70% reduction. Okay, this is better than in as many sprays as you want to make. Now, on top of that, if you're down to that two per tree and 10% are infested, you end up with 10 females per acre. That's what you got left. With only 10, and of course they don't all emerge at the same time, the males don't all emerge at the same time, you get to the point where it starts to be hard for the males and females to find each other. Okay? And then let's imagine they do get together and a female is mated and wants to lay eggs. Okay? Let's pretend that she's got 50 eggs that she wants to lay. Well, the first day, she's got to fly around a tree. She's got to find one of the two mummies on that tree and lay an egg on it. Then she's got to take wing, fly around, whatever she does to find the one other nut on that tree to lay an egg on it. Well, what's she have to do for the third egg? She's got to find another tree. She's got to fly to it, find one, and so on. So you can see, in order to lay 50 eggs, she has to fly to 25 different trees find both of the nuts on all of those trees, and in the process, not double back to the same nut, or not come to a nut that another female laid an egg on, or a nut that's already eaten out. Okay? You can see, when you get to these low numbers, there's just nowhere to lay eggs. Okay? So sanitation, you know, a lot of people think, oh, sanitation is important because I'm killing moths. That's part of it. But where it's really valuable is I'm getting to the point where there's nowhere for any of the small number of moths that survive to lay eggs. At that point, you really make an impact. And that's why that previous curve drops off so much as you start getting down to the lower numbers. It's not a linear relationship. It's a sort of exponential one that drops at that low end. So what's that say for sanitation? It says, you know, shaking trees, I mean, that's great. Mowing and blowing, that's great. Um, but, you know, if you're going through all that and you still got, you know, 100 nuts left in a tree or even 50 nuts left in a tree, um, you're not getting the full benefit out of it. Um, that's why polling crews are justified to get you down to two. Um, I realize they're expensive, uh, more expensive uh, than ever these days. And sometimes labor is becoming more and more difficult to find in the winter. But anything you can do to get down there is going to help you out. Uh, the other thing nice this year, you know, we have, have had some fog in the last few days. We have a little bit of water. Uh, that's going to help. Uh, the best time to shake trees is when the nuts are wet. Um, you know, as compared to last year where we had no rain in the South Valley and people were shaking dry trees and the mummies just didn't come out. So, okay, so that, that's sanitation principle-wise, what you're trying to do, why it's so effective. Um, and you know, I hope that, that everyone's adopting this as one of their four key components to an IPM program. Um, okay, the second part of this talk, so the mating disruption. So as I said, the goal is to prevent navel orange worm from being born in the first place. And the way we do this is putting pheromone out and the pheromone hits the receptors of the male, they get wigged out and they're unable to find the females. I'm actually gonna show you a video that talks about this. So I'm just, I'm gonna go through some slides really fast and then we'll show the video that covers some of the other things that, that you see printed here. Um, but uh, so real quickly, there, there's four main products, okay? Products are from Sotera, Pacific Biocontrol, Semios, and Trace. Uh, the video is going to cover that. Um, there's a final product from Sotera that's a sprayable product that I'll just touch on briefly. Um, but as far as these products go, efficacy-wise, here's a simple chart showing the, four the three aerosol and the meso products. 
They all give about a 50% reduction in damage. Um, this is uh, replicated research on 40 acre plots. You can see here, this is flight captures from the first, second, third, and fourth flights where you did and didn't use mating disruption on 100 acre plots. And you can see if you put out a mating disruption product in the spring, during all four flights, you get excellent trap shutdown. And that's all those black bars saying that the males couldn't find a trap. And the assumption is if males can't find a pheromone trap, they're gonna struggle finding a female. So this, this chart doesn't necessarily say that there's no males out there. Okay, this is just indicative that with main disruption, the males aren't finding the females. More efficacy data. Uh, this is nine different 100 acre side-by-side -side plots with and without mating disruption. And you can see here on these larger scale, we're getting a 50 to 70% reduction in damage. Um, the left chart there, you know, non-parels followed by the pollinizers. Both varieties, we see the reductions. That's quite repeatable year after year after year um, with those four products I mentioned. Um, the chart on the right just shows that uh, converted over into pounds per acre or kilograms per hectare, which is similar to pounds per acre um, across the varieties. Now we've done some economic studies on these, these data. And what it shows is that if you're about 1% damage, you're gonna break even. So let me, let me just summarize what that means here. So it, that means if you didn't use main disruption, if you have on the left, you can see here, if you had less than, you know, didn't use it and had less than 1% damage, if you had used it, it wouldn't have paid for itself, right? If you didn't use main disruption, you had 1% damage, you would have broken even. And if you had more than 1% damage and didn't use main disruption, you would have made more money had you invested in main disruption. In other words, you would have paid off your costs plus put more money in your pocket for Christmas. Um, on the right-hand side, what if you did use mating disruption? What are the numbers? So if you used it and you were under half a percent, in hindsight, you didn't quite need it. Um, call an insurance policy, uh, didn't pay for itself. Um, if you had a half a percent, you broke even. And if you had more than a half a percent damage when you use mating disruption, you actually made money um, it made money on your investment uh, because the amount of damage you would have had if you hadn't used it would have been more than the costs of what you paid for. So, so that's the that's kind of the economics of main disruption from lots and lots and lots of trials we've done. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump over and I want to show you a video. So we've done some work with the Almond Board. This is a a video that we put together that just talks about mating disruption. So this will actually show you the products, talk a little bit more about them, um, orient, orient you to them a, a little bit more. So hello, my name is David Havlin. I'm with the University of California Cooperative Extension, and I'm here today with the Almond Board to talk about mating disruption. Uh, mating disruption is one of the techniques that almond growers can use to help manage navel orangeworm, which of course is the biggest problem uh, as far as insects go facing the almond industry. Uh, every year, about 1% of all almonds get eaten. So when you add that up, that's about 25 million pounds of nuts every year. So we wanna make sure uh, everything is being done as possible that that doesn't happen. So as I said, main disruption is one way that almond growers can manage navel orangeworm. And the way this works is that male and female navel orangeworm in order to produce eggs have to mate. And mating occurs after the female releases a pheromone that attracts the male to her. Now what we can do is we can go into a laboratory and we can make just pounds and pounds and pounds of piles of pheromone. We can put that pheromone into cans and bottles and different formats and release that into the orchard. And what that does is when the pheromone is out there in high quantities, it lands on the navel orange room, the male's antenna, hits a receptor, and that receptor fires or gets activated to say that there's a female in the area. But when the entire orchard is filled with this pheromone, 
those receptors get triggered and triggered and triggered so many times that the males lose their ability to actually fly around and find females. And if a male can't find a female or is delayed in finding her, she either can't mate or is delayed in mating, which reduces the number of eggs. So what we're essentially doing is managing navel orange worm by making sure that they're never born in the first place. And that's pretty cool. So what we're gonna talk about today is some of the products that are out there that are available for mating disruption. In order to demonstrate how some of these mating disruption products work, I actually brought two older systems with me that are some of the original mating disruption cabinets used by Sutera. So as you can see inside this cabinet, we have a, a canister. Okay, the canister is, is pressurized. It's filled with pheromone. At the top, there's a set of electronics. So these electronics know when it's daytime and when it's nighttime. Uh, they know when the moths are flying and they're pre-programmed to know when to release pheromone so they can do it when the moths are active, not when they're uh, not active. Uh, there's also batteries and other things to run this unit for one year. So what I have on the table in front of me are the four different systems that are available for 2021. This includes the Checkmate Puffer NOW program from Sutera. It includes Pacific Bio Control's Isomate NOW Mist program. It's got the Semios NOW program from Semios and then the Sidetrack Meso program from Trace. And uh, there's a, some subtle differences between them that I'd, I'd like to go through. So first of all, the original aerosol products, uh, the Sotera ones that I mentioned over here, these were put out at two per acre, okay? We now know that two per acre is not needed. So all three of these aerosol products are all put out at the same rate, okay? That's one of these units per acre. All three of these are put out in, uh, it's about April 1st, prior to when the first flight occurs. And all these products last all season long. So there are some subtle differences between these units. Um, first of all, the Pacific Biocontrol and the Sotera product, okay? When you purchase these systems, you'll get a container that essentially has the cans and has the units. It's your responsibility as a grower to snap them together to turn them on and to hang them in the orchard. The Semio system is a little different, okay? The Semio system is actually a, a full service program that Semios offers. So in this case, if you, uh, if you sign up or subscribe to the Semios uh, program, they will actually put these together. They will install them in the field. They will remove them at the end of the season and they will take care of all of the maintenance, okay? So uh, different options for different people, depending on how you wanna do it. So the other product from Trace, the Miso product. So these particular strips actually come in a pack like this. Uh, you'll receive them. They come in a tote pouch and it's the grower's responsibility to take these. Now there's a range of application rates for the Trace product, but typically they're applied at a rate of 20 per acre plus or minus. Uh, but as I said, there's some flexibility. If you wanna put a few extra on the upwind side, a few less on the downwind side, um, that's your, your right to do so. Um, so when you put that all together, you know, talk to people, shop around. Most of these companies offer premiums or rebates for larger volume. Um, likewise, Semios has some programs that if you're willing to share data from your orchard with them, they'll give you some extra premiums or rebates um, on the package. So as I said, feel free to shop around and talk to different representatives to see what kind of deal you can get for your orchard and how their products will match up with your individual goals. I'm gonna stop the video right there. There's, there's about three more minutes on it that just talks a little bit about the economics and uh, shows how to hang them in trees. Uh, if you've got some questions on, you know, how do you actually hang them in the trees? Yeah, a little bit about the economics and stuff. Feel free to go to YouTube and watch the rest of that video. Um, it can be found on the Almond Boards YouTube channel. So let me go back to the presentation here. Okay, so, so that video introduced you to uh, the different companies, uh, the products that are available. Um, now, as, as I mentioned before, there are some other options that I, I didn't mention in that video uh, or thus far in this talk. Um, you know, we, we've done some experimental work. We've also done some work with sprayable pheromones. And just want to show you here, just quick results, three years worth of replicated trials. Um, on the left side is pheromone trap captures from third flight. On the right side is pheromone trap captures from the fourth flight. And if you look at the, 
the bars down here. So starting from left, the light blue and the orange, okay, that's captures with the aerosol and meso products. You can see um, excellent trap shut down there compared to the untreated check, which is the blue. But if you look at the gray and the, the sort of yellowy orange um, bars, you can see we're still catching a lot of moths. So the gray bar is where we applied sprayable pheromone four times during the season. The yellow bars is where we sprayed it twice. Um, and by the way, we're evaluating two different sprayable products, okay, not just products from one company. Um, but you can see here with the sprayable products, we're getting a few less moths in the third flight, not really any reduction in moths in the fourth flight. But categorically, uh, with the sprayable products, we're not getting traps shut down. Not quite sure why, um, but it just hasn't been successful. Um, and then we go to harvest data. Um, on the left here is non-parel data. You can see the, the first two bars. That's the 50% or so reduction in damage you get with the aerosol meso products. And then you can see the gray and yellow and the blue. Um, that's the four or two applications of sprayable and the untreated. No difference at all in damage at harvest. And then same on Monterey. Uh, we always get a lot more variability in, in Monterey data, but you can see there that the, the three bars at the end, um, that's the, the C, the highest there was where we applied the, the sprayable four times, um, and then the orange twice, and then the dark blue um, is the control. So not quite sure why the sprayable products aren't causing trap shutdown or reductions in damage, uh, but that's what we've seen with all of our plots uh, three years in a row now. Okay, so so with that, main disruption conclusions, and then we'll move on. Um, you know, so does it work? Aerosols, yes. Mesos, yes. The sprayable, um, I'm just putting currently under evaluation or analysis, um, just saying that in, in three years, we haven't seen any data suggesting that the sprayable products work. Uh, is it affordable? Use the 1% rule. If you typically get 1% damage, it's, it pays for itself. But you have to remember there's more to it than that. Um, in fact, I was I was gave a, a presentation to a large uh, large grower yesterday with you know, about 30, 35 of their key company people. And you know, they, this company was talking about um, you know, what it means to them to be able to say that they produce almonds sustainably. Uh, and this is also pistachio growing, you know, what it means sustainably. Main disruption fits that. Um, you know, what there's talking about, you know, every time. You know, every time there's an aflatoxin issue, what it costs per load, uh, whether that's on the front end or whether that's rejected at a port somewhere across the sea. Um, you know, those kinds of intangibles also have value. You know, just remember, anytime you use main disruption, you're reducing the number of damaged kernels that go to the hauler by one half. So even if what you spend for it and what you get out of it are the same economically, I guarantee every hull is going to recommend using it because every hauler would love to have half the damage that they have to deal with when they're trying to haul and shell, um, you know, haul and shell your, your nuts at the processors. So, okay, moving on to early and timely harvest. So again, let's talk about principles here because, you know, there's sort of a mistake that I hear people make. It's common for them to say, oh yeah, I know I should harvest earlier because, you know, the longer the nuts are out there, the more damage they can sustain. That's true, but it's much more, I don't say more complicated, but it's, it's, there's more to it than that. Um, we need to look a little deeper. So to do that, let me give you two scenarios. Okay, so let's imagine um, non -parels. Let's do an almond example. So let's imagine it's the 4th of July. Um, your hulls, you know, you started getting hull split. And during the next couple of weeks, you get navel orange from come in and lay eggs on those nonpareils. Okay, so you now have these worms that are developing in their nonpareils that in August, you know, about four to five weeks later are gonna become adults. Uh, you know, they're gonna pupate and they'll become adults. Okay, so those worms that got laid during a couple of weeks after hull split, when they become adults, will become the third flight. Okay, so let's look at scenario one. You know, what happens if you take all of those nonpareils, you harvest them in the beginning of August, while all of those worms are still larvae or maybe pupae, but haven't become adults. So in that scenario, you know, what, what percentage of the nuts come off a tree when you shake your nonpareil? Okay, 
99 point something percent, right? So when you think about it, you're taking 99 plus percent of all of the worms in those nonpareils, knocking them on the ground, windrowing them, hauling them out of the field and fumigating them before any of those worms can become the third flight. So it's, so what you're doing is sort of twofold. You're, you're preventing, you're, you're getting the nuts out of the field before they can get reinfested by the third flight, but you're actually preventing the third flight, which means you can avoid that pinhole damage in your nonpareils that occurs in August, but also that you're gonna have a reduced third flight that can't lay eggs in your Monterey's or whatever pollinators happen to be out there susceptible in August, a month or more after your last insecticide spread. Okay? So again, you're not just protecting the nuts, but you're actually employing a management program that's 99% effective at preventing subsequent flights. Okay, now to the contrary, what if you shake that same tree on August 20th or 25th, which in the Southern Valley would be you know, 10 days after the third flight starts? In that case, every one of those worms in those nonpareils pupates becomes an adult. They all become this massive third flight that lays eggs back on your nonpareils, that lays eggs all up and down your pollinators, and you end up with a pollinator nightmare at harvest. Okay. So it, the interesting thing about those two scenarios, you know, what I just talked about, night and day difference. And it has nothing to really do with pest pressure, it has nothing to do with weather, it has nothing to do with your insecticide programs. Like the difference between the two is just one factor. What date do you shake the tree? So that's why we say the earlier you shake, you know, timely harvest, get in as soon as you can is gonna help. Now, what I just described for nonpareils and almonds, the same exact scenario is the same for kermans, for example, in pistachios except in that case, you're talking about the fourth flight. Okay? So if you can shake your kermans while all of the third generation of worms from August, okay, from, from hull slip to harvest, if you can haul all of those nuts out of the field, you know, think about it. You're getting 99% control of the third generation by shaking the nuts, sending them to a processor, send them in a bath, ripping off the hulls and drying them down within 24 hours, they're gone. When that happens, you end up with a very small fourth flight and your first shake comes off really clean. And because your first shake pulled out any worms, your second shake tends to be really clean. Okay? To the contrary, if your first shake isn't until 20th or you know, beyond the 20th of September, all of that third generation emerges and it lays eggs back into your first shake as well as what's gonna become your second shake. Okay? So, um, I'm not exactly sure in other parts of the state, but but in Kern County, basically you'd say anything you shake in you know in almonds before about August 10th is going to escape the third flight, the third generation. Anything that you shake before about September 10th to to 15th, somewhere in there, is going to escape the fourth generation of, of either almonds or or uh, or pistachios. So, you know, if you're not satisfied with your, with your levels of damage to both of these pests, you know, some people say, what do we do? I need to spray more. Take a look at your harvest dates, correlate your harvest dates to your levels of damage, because it might be that either contracting more harvesters or buying or investing in more harvesters is going to do more to reduce your damage than going out and spraying more. A delicate balance, but one to consider. Um, this, just to drive home this point, th these are two charts, uh, 2012 and 2013, from pistachios. This is thousands of loads from five different counties. And what we did is we took all that data, sort of put it on a degree day calendar to, you know, to make all the different parts of the state um, line up with each other. But you can see the curve from all these data points of damage over time. And if you run a correlation on these curves, what it showed is that in pistachios, damage doubling time is about 10 days. So if you've got 1% damage today, if you wait 10 days, you'll have two. If you wait 10 more days, you'll have four, and so on. Um, 
So, you know, if you're on the very front end of this curve where, you know, a quarter becomes a half and a half becomes one, eh, that's, that's not the end of the world. But if you're out there where you've got one or two, the point being that one or two becomes two to four within 10 days, it happens very fast. So again, just driving home this point, timely harvest, anything you can do to get these nuts off earlier is gonna help you. Okay, moving on to insecticides. Perfect, keeping track of my time here. So insecticides, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on insecticides because there's, there's not a whole lot of options out there. And there's just so many scenarios. So I'm just gonna kind of start with the take home points. So first of all, if you're an almond or pistachio grower, guaranteed you're gonna make an insecticide application at whole split or initiation of whole split. Okay, so that's gonna be around the 4th of July, something like that for most almond orchards. And then, you know, pistachios will be about a, about a month behind that. Now, in areas that have a lot of navel orange and pressure, you're gonna come back in two to three weeks with a second insecticide spray. Um, very, very common. Now, any other spray besides those two, these are gonna be the exceptions to the rule, not the rule. Okay, so, you know, if you just historically have been annihilated by navel orange worm, you might consider an April to May treatment. Um, they're not as, a, that timing is not nearly as effective as the later timings. But again, if you got an emergency, you got to put out a fire, um, go ahead and consider something in May. Um, the other thing, particularly in pistachios, is to watch early splits. So in pistachios, in some years, about two weeks or so, you know, maybe a little more than that before the main crop starts to have the whole slip, you'll get these early pea splits. And those pea, slip, pea split nuts absolutely can be host for navel orangeworm and they'll lay eggs on it. So in pistachios in July, uh, you wanna be watching, you know, mid to late July to see how many of these early split or pea split nuts you have. If, you've, if it's a year that you have a lot, and you're seeing eggs on them, you might wanna consider an insecticide spray at that timing instead of waiting till hull split. Um, you know, if you, in that case, if you wait till hull split, you're just, you're behind already. Uh, but again, optional year by year, no one should be doing that spray every year. You know, your first pistachio spray should be in August. And then I'm just gonna say these decisions are multifactorial. Um, there's no rule. You know, you have to look at what's the past damage, how good was your sanitation? Um, when are you going to harvest? You know, if you know you're going to get in and harvest really early in this particular field, you can manage it differently than one you know is going to be your last to come off. The, to, to come off, um, you have to look at flight timings, you know, your trap captures. Um, you know, there, there's no technical correlation that says if you catch so many moths in a trap, you should or shouldn't spray. Um, lots of efforts have been made to, to collect that data, and the correlations just aren't very good. At the same time, there is a difference between catching 10 versus catching 100 in a week, um, just to get a general feel for what kind of pressure you have. So, you know, the job of PCA is just to take all that information in, um, you know, look at degree day models, when's the flight coming, look at pheromone traps to in indicate that some moths are there, look at when your nuts are starting to split or slip, look at all those timings based on past damage, based on the numbers in the traps. And based on that, you're going to come up with your approach that in most cases is gonna be one to two sprays that's typically Intrepid and Alticor, okay? One of each, um, rotating is the standard program. Um, in some cases, um, you know, th there are some other products out there. Um, they're just, you know, other worm products, they're just not very effective on navel orange worm in particular. Um, they're great on, you know, great on codly moth, great on peach twig borer, you know, products like Delegate. Uh, they're just, they're just not very good on navel orange worm. Now, things to watch out for when you're spraying. Um, in almonds, be really careful with your navel orange worm sprays. Particularly, you want to avoid pyrethroids and spinosins. Okay, spinosins would be like delegate or success um, or, or intrepid edge. Okay? Intrepid's fine, but intrepid edge is intrepid plus delegate. And the reason you want to watch out for those is because those products kill the natural enemies that are predators of spider mites. Um, so, you know, anytime you put a pyrethroid or, or a spinosin at hull split, you can expect to kill six spotted thrips and you can expect to have much more serious mite problems during harvest. So avoid that. 
Um, pistachios, that's not the case. Um, you know, in the case of pistachios, there aren't really pests that get flared. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no pistachio equivalent of spider mites and almonds. Um, so in that case, it's more common to throw a pyrethroid in the tank because you don't have as much baggage with it. Um, likewise, um, a, lot of, a lot of pistachio growers will use Intrepid Edge instead of Intrepid uh, because of the, the little bit of extra they feel that comes from the delegate part of it. But again, on the almond side, any perks you might get from throwing delegate in are going to be counterbalanced by losses in mite management. So yeah, Intrepid and Alticor, that, that's pretty much it. Now, the, the scary point with that is, um, as far as what's coming down the pipe, there really isn't anything. So just be really careful with resistance management. You know, the, the reality is there's 2 million acres of almonds, pistachios, and walnuts in California. And most of those 2 million acres get treated with both Intrepid and Alticor in most years. So from a resistance management standpoint, that should scare the heck out of everybody listening to this talk. So anything we can do that's non-chemical is going to help out. Okay, sanitation is non-chemical, it's going to help. Mating disruption is going to help. Timely harvest is going to help uh, to take some pressure off of these two active ingredients that we're very heavily relying on. Okay, um, the last topic, is checking my time here, yeah, last topic is monitoring. And I've got another video that's going to go through this. Um, it's going to use most of the time, just checking my time here. Yeah, it's going to pretty much wrap us up. So. So mummy counts um, can help you know with sanitation, how good it was, but then there's egg traps, there's pheromone traps, and then there's what's called PPO traps. Um, those are also attracted to a female. We use those in mating disruption. So all of these traps, uh, different traps have different purposes, different value within an IPM program. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show another video. Uh, the video is gonna go through the different traps, um, how they work, what they're you know used for and so on, and at that uh, that's pretty much going to be the end of my presentation. Um, I'll just make a couple of concluding comments, and then I'll turn the time um, at that you know at that point turn the time back over to to uh, to Stephanie for and Cheryl for a, a wrap up and polls and and things like that, so you can get your credits today. Well, hello, I'm David Haviland with the University of California Cooperative Extension, and I'm here today with the All Board of California to talk about monitoring for navel orange worm. And monitoring is a very important part of an integrated pest management program for navel orange worm. If you don't know what the moth's doing, uh, it's hard to know how to control it. And so what we want to do, uh, either you or your pest control advisor each year, is you want to keep track of where are the moths, when are the moths present, and how many are there, as well as when are the eggs being laid, and when are they present, and when are they potentially a harm for you. And there's a few different ways to do that. So the first technique is with what's called an egg trap. So egg traps come in a couple of different forms, but they're black cylinders that look like this. They have grooves in the top, and then they have a mesh in the middle. Along with these egg traps, you'll get a pouch or, or packet of almond meal. It's an oily ground up almond meal that's very attractive to the navel orange room females. This meal is poured inside the top of the cylinder. You put the top back on, you hang this in the orchard, loop that over a limb, and you come back one week later to see what happens. When you come back, you'll see little orange to amber colored eggs lining uh, right here inside these grooves. So you'll count those and keep track of those numbers either once or twice a week, okay? That's how you use the egg trap. The other types of traps you can see in front of me here, we have wing traps on this side of the table and we have delta traps on this side of the table. So wing and delta traps are used for pheromone traps, PPO traps, and for Peterson traps. And I'll walk through each of those with you. So the pheromone traps are made to catch males. Okay, the female releases pheromone in the orchard. The males sense that pheromone and try to find her. So what we do is we take lures that look like this. 
Okay, this small little plastic containers. Uh, they look different from different companies. These lures are placed inside of one of these traps, okay? Inside of a wing trap or inside of a delta trap. We like to have them placed in the tops of the traps. Uh, they're most effective that way. You place the lures inside and leave the trap in the field for a week. The male moths think there's a female inside of the trap. They fly to it and they get stuck on the sticky surface that you can see here in the bottom. These traps are specifically catching males. So what if you also want to catch females? Uh, that can be a little more tricky because a female, of course, is not attracted to a pheromone. So to solve that problem, a new lure has come out that's called a PPO lure. Uh, this stands for phenyl propionate, and this is a scent that's given off by a tree that's attractive also to the female. So to make a PPO trap, what you do is you put a regular pheromone lure in, okay, like we previously described, also with this PPO lure, and the two of those in combination with each other are gonna catch both males and females. Now, the other way to catch females in particular, if that's what you're interested in, is to put in what's called a sachet, and we call this now a Peterson trap. So this sachet contains ground up pistachio meats, and when you take these meats and you grind them up, the oils and all the scents are released. If you smell this, it definitely smells like pistachios, and the females will smell that They'll think it's a great place to lay eggs in the orchard. They'll fly into the trap, okay? You can imagine if this is in the top of the trap here, they'll fly in to lay an egg and the female will get stuck on the sticky. So again, males or females, you have options. Now, what are some of the uses of these traps? Uh, first of all, egg traps are specifically used early in the season. The greatest benefit you get from there, uh, from them, is to determine a biofix. So you're gonna go out in the orchard, check these twice a week, particularly in April, and you're gonna find that for a few weeks or a couple weeks you don't catch any eggs, and then you'll catch a few, and eventually you'll go two evaluation dates that both have eggs. That date is what we call a biofix. Okay, that marks the date that egg laying has begun. If you take that date and use degree day models, Okay, every 1,050 degree days, navel orange worm will complete a generation. So if you know when the egg laying starts in April and you use degree day models that are available on the University of California's IPM program uh, website, you can estimate when those eggs will become adults and produce eggs of their own, which is typically going to be around hull split. That can help you time your hull split spray to know exactly when you want to get it there to make sure those products uh, most of which these days control eggs and larvae, can be applied right when those eggs and larvae are being uh, laid, and that way you can protect your almond crop as it starts to split. Now, the pheromone traps are a little bit different because, as I mentioned, they are collecting males. So with males, you want to be watching for flights. You want to know when a flight starts, you want to know the peak of the flight, and you want to know the end of the flight. So Naval Orange Room typically has a first flight that occurs in April and May. They have a second flight, which is the one you care about the most, that starts uh, right before or right at the start of hull split of nonpareils and goes for a few weeks. And then you have a third flight that typically starts in August, okay? and that's gonna occur right around the time uh, nonpareils are, are starting to be shaken, uh, a little bit after that, and occur mostly in the month of August. And then if you're in the southern half of the industry, you also have a fourth flight, which will occur in September. So if you can know when the flights are starting, how high they get, and where they're ending, you can use that information to know, first of all, how much risk you might be at eggs from those moths. But also, you can do tricky things like, if you know when the third flight is gonna start, you can also figure out whether or not your nonpareils will be harvested before or after that flight starts. If you know you're, you're gonna harvest your nonpareils before the third flight starts, you don't need to be as aggressive on insecticide sprays. Likewise, if you can predict that that third flight is gonna occur a couple of weeks before you're able to get your nonpareils off the tree, in that case, you're gonna, be, you're gonna need to be more aggressive with an insecticide spray, perhaps do two sprays in that orchard to help make sure that those nonpareils and those pollinators are protected. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people ask, what about thresholds? They say, how many moths in a trap 
or how many eggs in an egg trap justifies a treatment. Unfortunately, things are not that simple. Okay, the amount of damage you get from navel orange worm has to do with how many moths there are, when they occur, okay? That has to do with how, many, how much damage you had last year. It has to do with the level of sanitation, okay? Has to do with overwintering survival. And a lot of it has to do with harvest date. So because of that, there's no magic number that says if you catch 20 moths in a pheromone trap that you should spray once or 40 indicates twice, that kind of thing. However, you absolutely can compare trap captures this year to those from the previous year and the year before that to get a general feel for whether or not you're in what might, you might call a good or a bad year with relation to navel orange room. And that can definitely help you make decisions on how aggressive you need to be with your sprays. Okay, I'm gonna stop it right there for sake of time. There's, there's a few more minutes on that video if you wanna go in and get a little bit more information on monitoring. But for the, for the sake of time, I'm gonna stop it there. Let me just go back, um, bring the other presentation back up. Perfect. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so just, just concluding comments here. You know, so what is IPM for naval orange worm? And um, it, it's kind of straightforward. You know, we, we need to do monitoring to see the flights, to kind of know, as I just said in the video, to know when they're starting and ending, you know, to know how much risk we're at and, and when we should properly time some management actions. But then it comes down to sanitation, you know, very important, main disruption, great tool for a lot of growers, not every grower, but for a lot of growers in the state. Some, it's something everyone should consider and that many people should be implementing. Um, and then, and, and many people are. And then timely harvest, doing the best you can there. And insecticides, uh, they are and will continue to be a part of the program. Fortunate thing is, you know, people that are doing all of these typically have excellent control. Um, you know, navel orange worm damage on non pareils is typically under 1%, and pollinators, you know, typically under 2% for when all these things are being implemented properly. So uh, I guess that's the, the positive note to end on, uh, that, that IPM can be achieved, your damage can be low, uh, you can be successful. I realize that it's costly to accomplish all of that, um, but at least the tools are there. And, you know, I, I know that you know, a lot of researchers are out there, um, you know, continuing work to try and see what we can do to make even further improvements in the future. So with that, thanks for joining us today. Um, and then I'll just conclude with a, a shout out here for those of you that are almond growers, uh, just to let you know that the majority, um, actually almost, well, yeah, the vast majority of the work that was presented today uh, is work that was funded by you as almond growers through the Almond Board of California, um, through their efforts to use the funds they get from you to to do research that will be of direct benefit to you. Uh, and some of this work was funded by DPR through a Pest Management Alliance grant that we had, uh, particularly related to mating disruption. Um, so in that case, thank you to taxpayers through DPR for helping fund that. Um, and then in particular, that research on mating disruption, I just wanna send a thank you also, you know, Pacific Power Control, Semios, Trace, and Sotera. Uh, those four companies have been great as far as providing us with large quantities of products for large, you know, thousands and thousands of acres worth of trials that are necessary to, to actually do a proper evaluation of those products. So thank you to those particular companies also. So yeah, so with that, thank you very much and glad you made it here. And I'll turn the time over to Stephanie for your polling and questions and whatever else you need to do. And I'll stay on as long as you need me. Okay, so with that, we can do questions now. <laughs> um, all right, so... We do have a, a couple of people in the Q&A asking how far can the navel orange worm moth fly? So I'm going to respond by saying that's the wrong question. And I'll, I'll respond to that question with a question. If you were super dehydrated and thirsty, how far would you walk through a desert to find water? Okay. I mean, obviously, if you got a swimming pool in front of you, not very far, if the, the closest oasis is five miles away, you're going to walk a long ways. So the answer to your navel orange room question is pretty similar to that. You know, a, a, a navel orange room that's right in the middle of a whole bunch of nuts, in a, you know, that are split, isn't going to go very far. 
Um, at the same time, you know, if you drop one in the middle of a desert and in a cotton field and the closest almond orchard or pistachio orchard is five miles away, they can get there. Um, so they're, they're very good flyers. Um, but typically what we talk about is that they move back and forth. So, you know, if you've got a, you know, an almond orchard with a lot of worms next to a pistachio orchard, you know, they'll, they'll go 30 rows in, you know, 20 rows in, but there's definitely an edge effect where those five rows on the end will have the most. Um, so yeah, how far can they fly? A long ways. How far do they really fly? As far as they need to, to find a mate, or as far as they need to, to find a good place to lay an egg. And obviously, it depends on whether you're a boy or a girl, you know, as to how a, a moth is going to answer that question, because, you know, the two adults are obviously programmed to do two different things, um, you know, as adults. Hopefully that answered the question with a question. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, the next question is, will the females lay eggs on nuts on the ground? So they can, but they don't like to. Um, they really, so they really prefer to be in the tops of the trees. Um, like, like if you were just to, like, if you were to put a hundred nuts in the top of a tree, a hundred nuts in the middle of a tree, a hundred nuts at the bottom and a hundred nuts in the ground, you will see a, a stratification that absolutely most, most of the ones in the top will be hit and then progressively lower on the ground. Um, but ground mummies. So, so yes, they can lay eggs on them, but really what you're worried about with, with nuts on the ground is when you shake a tree in the winter, the nuts are on the ground, and then the nuts don't get destroyed. Um, it's not so much that they're a great place for the moths to lay eggs, it's that those have worms in them that will become moths. Um, so it's more, for, it's more for the get rid of the worms reason you wanna destroy mummies on the ground than it is to prevent the mummies from being a place to lay eggs. Again, they can, but they'd rather not. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Jose asking for mating dis disruption for both almond and pistachios, aerosol puffer applications during the, sorry, this is a long question. The, for the aerosol puffer applications during the spring season, um, what is the average number of puffs or uh, the frequency in one day? So, so, I'm, so I don't know the, exact details on that, but generally speaking, um, all three of the devices, okay, so the, the Pacific Biocontrol, the Soterra, and the, uh, the, the um, Simulus Biocontrol, Soterra, yeah, those, those three products. Um, they're basically off during the day, on during the night. I'm not sure if it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off, but it, it's something along those lines, plus or minus a little bit. And I believe that they're puffing or you know releasing about every 15 minutes during that period of time, or, or during the period that they're on during each 24 hour period. Um, now, there is an exception to that. Um, so the SEMIO system, uh, the SEMIO system is programmable. So somebody can actually sit at a computer and change that. You know, if you want it to release all day, you can. If you want it to release every five minutes, you can. Um, you, you can change that on the fly. Um, whereas the other systems, you know, from Soterra and Pacific Biocontrol, those it's, it's about every 15 minutes each night from the time they're turned on until they run out of gas. All right, thank you. Um, we do have a question asking, are there any biological control options? Yeah, so biocontrol is a difficult one for navel orange worm. So there is a parasitoid, um, the problem is the parasitoid is not effective at low densities. So, you know, I could say, you want to have parasitism? You know, I, I, I can give you a formula to have 50% of navel orange worm parasitized. All you have to do is have about 40% of your nuts infested and biocontrol will get established. <laughs> so obviously that's not acceptable. Um, so yeah, down at the really low densities, it's just not very good. Now, pistachios is a little bit different because uh, there's a small bug, Phytochorus. Phytochorus in the spring does eat navel orange from eggs. It's actually fairly effective. Um, I've actually watched them come in and just clean house on the eggs on egg traps in the spring. One of the problems is Phytochorus can also sting young nuts as do other small bugs. So uh, there's a fine line between promoting phyto Phytochorus 
for small bug control versus going in and killing all small bugs like Phytochorus and Calichorus and Ligus and so on to make sure they're not stinging those young nuts um, before, you know, before the shell hardens uh, in April-ish, uh, maybe into early May. So yeah, unfortunately it's just, you know, biocontrol for navel orange is just not, not great like it is for let's say spider mites. You know, and you gotta remember too, you know, biocontrol adults, you know, most insects biocontrol adults isn't very good unless a bird eats them. You know, most biocontrol gets the immature stages. And the immature stage for navel orange worm is a worm that's inside a kernel protected by a hull, protected by a shell. Um, so if something like a lacewing wants to eat it, it's got to eat the egg and it's got a day or two to do it. Otherwise that worm is inaccessible. So yeah, I wish bowel control was better. It's just, it's not a key component um, like it is for other worms and other pests. Okay, great. Um, we just have one more question, a uh, kind of minor one um, asking, this person is, is curious about why um, they don't ever seem to see photos of dark phase navel orange worm moths in, in presentations. I'm not sure if there's they say the light phase moths, uh, the dark phase moths and the light phase ones are just as common. I'm not sure about this. So this is- No they're... idea. Okay. Whoever it is, tell them to send me a picture and explain their question. Okay. I, I'm not familiar with that with navel orange room. I mean, there's, I'm familiar with like spotted wing drosophila and other, you know, and other crops where there's absolutely a dark phase and a light phase. Um, but in that case, in California, we never see the dark phase. You know, you have to be in like Michigan in sub 30 and then it goes dark, um, but in our climate it doesn't. So, yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I can say, I'm an author on the University of California's IPM guidelines, and on navel orange from chapters in two different books with lots of authors. And light phase and dark phase is never mentioned in any of those documents. So I'd love to hear, love to hear more about that because I'm not sure what you're referring to. Thanks, David. Cool. Um, we do have another question uh, from Tracy asking. Do we know how big the area of attraction is for egg traps and the ground pistachios in mesh bags? I understand it's pretty small, but do we know the distance? So I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, as far as the mesh bags go, we, we ha actually haven't had a whole lot of success in our research trials with the Peterson traps. Um, we've compared them with the others and we don't catch a whole lot in them comparatively. Um, but yeah, the area of influence, I don't know. If you really want to know the answer to that, the, the expert would really be Chuck Burks. Um, Chuck's done more work than anybody on that kind of uh, more basic, you know, research that requires statistics that I don't know how to do. So feel free to give him a call or, or an email. Um, Chuck's very approachable and fascinated by these types of these types of questions, and I'm sure he'll give you a he'll give you an answer that accurately reflects the current knowledge on the topic. Um, knowledge will be. Okay. We had one person ask about, um, and I'm not sure if this question was from David. Uh, they were asking if we could get information on apple moth. Apple moth or apple maggot? Yes, apple moths. That's what they said. Apple moths. I don't know if that's referring to light brown apple moth that has nothing to do with nut crops but they're referring to codly moth in apples. And I'll just say, I'm guessing it's probably a codly moth question for apples. And if that's the case, uh, I would suggest consulting with, you know, the UCIPM website it has great information there on insecticides and mating disruption and monitoring and so on, or um, call your local farm advisor, um, you know, pretty much anywhere in California that grows apples, there is, a pomologist there that can help you out. Um, and if they can't help you out, they know who to call to get information to help you out. Um, we don't, Kern County doesn't have a whole lot of apples, so I'm not completely up on that. Um, and if it is called in moth, it's also a walnut pest. And likewise, we don't have a lot of walnuts down in Kern County. So I don't quite consider myself the expert there, like, like on the navel orange room front. But UC can still help you out. Okay. Um, so that's the last question. So it looks like we're all set for today. Thank you, David, um, for answering all those questions and for the great presentation. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Nope, thank you all.